Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Steven Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian, and on behalf of Library Director Joe Lucia and the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to this semester's first event in the Scholarship at Villanova Lecture Series, featuring a talk by Dr. Chigi Akoma. The Scholarship at Villanova series is a library-sponsored forum for, for faculty authors and award recipients to showcase their latest academic research and publications. And before I introduce Dr. Akoma to you, I'd like to brief, briefly let you know about two other up, upcoming events this semester in the Scholarship at Villanova series. On Wednesday, March 11th at 2.30 p.m., Dr. Sean Houghton will, be, will present a lecture entitled The Valuation Effects of Real Estate Investment Trust Common Stock Repurchases. And on Thursday, March 26th at 2.30 p.m., uh, 2008 Outstanding Faculty Research Award recipient Dr. Robert Defina will speak here in the first floor lounge on the impact of mass incarceration on poverty. Uh, more information on these events is available on posters around campus and on the library's web pages at library.villanova.edu. This afternoon, the library is pleased to present to you Dr. Chiji Akoma, Associate Professor of English at Villanova. Originally from Nigeria, Dr. Akoma earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in Nigeria and then, amid political strife in his home country, moved to the United States in 1993 to pursue a PhD in English at SUNY Binghamton. He joined the English faculty at Villanova in 2001. Dr. Akoma's research is centered around African and African diasporic folkloric traditions and his essays and poems have been published in a host of journals including Research in African Literatures, Oral Tradition, and world literature written in English. In particular, Dr. Akoma's research is centered, um, uh, has sought to broaden the conceptualization of folklore and African oral performance traditions to include consideration of New World African narratives. In, in his book, Folklore in New World Black Fiction, Writing and the Oral Traditional Aesthetics, published in 2007 by Ohio State University Press and available for perusal and purchase at the table in the back, Dr. Okoma demonstrates that beyond the mere referencing of established elements of African oral tradition, New World writers of African descent, via the written word, are actively recreating and transforming these traditions to encompass and express their African diasporic identity and experience. Here to present his work and also to offer reflections on New World African identity in light of the ascendance of President Barack Obama, would you welcome please Dr. Chiji Okoma. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I need a drink. Water. I want to thank you for uh, sacrificing a little bit of your time this afternoon to, to be here uh, to listen to this talk. And um, this is a totally uncharted territory for me. Uh, this is my first book, so I don't have any kind of precedence you know, or experience to work with in terms of how this will go. And so uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, to give you a kind of context for this particular work uh, as a modestly uh, you know, modestly short work, uh, but to give you a kind of uh, context in which it, was, it came about. And then to talk a little bit more, a little bit about the issues that are very much engaged in this book. Uh, at the heart of the book is actually a, what I'll call my own effort at uh, sharing a little bit of what I like doing, and which some of my students will probably have heard me say, which is just the joys of literary analysis, you know, just the joys of looking at text and then reading them, you know, without any kinds of uh, bias toward a particular kind of theory as much as simply trying to see how meanings are made, how meanings are generated in text, in literary works, in that sense. So, um, I'll talk about the text, therefore, I'll, take a, I'll talk about the book uh, principally in terms of that context, in terms of that background, and then talk about the bigger issue, which is the, the ways by which we understand folklore, or at least the way in which I've tried to engage the idea of folklore, you know, especially black folklore, in my reading 
of uh, four New World writers. Uh, to be clear, the, the writers are Tony Morrison and Jean Tuma here in the United States from United States and uh, Wilson Harris and Roy Heath. Uh, from Guyana, so I'm um, I'm straddling, you know, the two sides of uh, of the Americas, North America, United States, and Guyana, which is essentially South America, uh, even though it, it fits within the Caribbean. Um, I would like to begin um, by reading a section of the afterword. Uh, that afterward, you know, because it's not really a conclusion, it's more like an afterward, you know, where I'm trying to locate the inspiration for this particular book. So I'd like to read a section of that afterward, uh, which is actually a story. Um, and I want to begin there. That afterward is titled Of Goat, of Goat Path and Dixie Pike, uh, which is a title, which is a title taken from Jean Thomas Cain, uh, from the story Karma. Uh, and one of the part of Karma, you know, this this very unique woman. Uh, part of what the narrator, part of how the narrator describes Karma is that uh, she's always in overalls. She has arms strong as a man's. Uh, she has the smell of farmyard uh, as the fragrance from her. And then there's this section, you know, in that particular short section of, of, of uh, Jean Tumas Cain, uh, and where the narrator says about this figure, she does not sing. Her body is a song. She is in the forest dancing. Torches flare, juju men, gree gree, witch doctors, torches gal. The Dixie Pike has grown from a good path in Africa. Um, and that is, you know, to me, that really summed up this idea of trying to understand the, the notion of diaspora, black diaspora identity, uh, the connection which one can find from the good path uh, in Africa, in a rural area in Africa, to the Dixie Pike, uh, the quintessential racial divide, as it were, that defines our American experience here. And to me, therefore, looking at that particular metaphor of the Dixie Pike and the good path, therefore, seemed to me to shed light on part of the kind of diaspora identity, or at least what I was trying to do, I'm trying to do in this in this particular book. So I'll read to you, you know, it's just about five minutes or so, and then I'll, I'll take it from there. And there I note that in, in text, I said inspiration for this project came about many years ago when I came across an anthology of Guyanese mythic figures and read the entry for uh, Cooley Jumbi. Cooley Jumbi is a spirit that prowls around cemeteries and confronts unsuspecting passers-by with a wide grin, saying, ever see teeth like this? Uh, as it exposes a frightening, jagged dentition made up of metals, broken bottles, and pins. I was shocked. Years before I read that book of myths from Caribbean, while back in middle school in Nigeria, some of us would ask one of the gods in the boarding school I attended to tell us stories. Day John, this particular god, was one of the three security men who worked the night shift, and he always obliged us. He walked with a limp, and we always wondered how he could or how he would cope if he had to chase an intruder on foot. Because it was late at night, often after regulation time, regulation time in the boarding school being 10.30 p.m., uh, because it was late at night, he always chose to tell creepy stories. You know, stories like infants crying in the bushes only to gobble up the unsuspecting adult who rushed in sympathy to save the child. Beautiful women standing by the roadside who turned out to be just skeletons using one of their ancient bones to crush the head of the unfortunate lover. Men who were actually women and seemed to enjoy inflicting pain on the opposite sex. Day John was just full of such stories, you know, stories with gloomy endings. And this elementary school dropout in his late 50s regaled us with those stories for years to come in boarding school. Our boarding school actually had was, you know, was a combination of both the middle school and the high school. Uh, a few weeks before our high school graduation, 
I remember Dave John telling us a special story. He said it was a true story of an incident that had happened to him and that he wanted to use it to explain his fascination with ghost stories. According to him, he was in his early 20s and he had a job as a driver for an executive in an oil company in Port Harcourt, a city about an hour away from where our school was located. He enjoyed the benefit of taking the car home and reporting at the executive's home early each morning. On this one day, it was approaching midnight before he started home. On the way home, there was this long stretch of road where nobody lived. It was in that area that they John told us he beheld a terrible sight. On the roadside, was the body of a man lying spread eagled <coughs> with eyes wide open and mouth in a wide grin that exposed his full front teeth. It was when he stopped by the body that he saw that they were not human teeth at all, but an assortment of broken bottles in jagged positions. One glimpse at the body, and he quickly fled away in dread. Five minutes later, he saw a young woman carrying a sack on her head, flagging down his approaching car. Dave John could not imagine what the woman could be doing on the road at that hour of the night. But he was so grateful, so grateful for the prospect of human company that he pulled up to where the woman stood. She got in after putting the sack in the trunk of the car and did John, without prompting, began telling the woman about the frightful sight he had just witnessed. The woman did not say a word, but kept, hmm, 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 hmm. That's all, that was all that John was hearing. Never saying a word, nodding and grunting as Dejan John told this story. And as she listened, she kept her eyes straight on the road. After Dejan John had finished describing the ghastly grin on the man's feet, on the, on the man's face, and told her how he had never seen a mouth full of broken bottles in place of teeth. Immediately, the woman turned to Dave John and wide out said, Abby, not like this. Uh, that's pigeon. Uh, for is it similar to this? Or does it look like this? And she opened a wide mouth revealing rows of sharp objects, needles, nails, and pieces of broken bottles that stood where teeth should be. According to Dave John, right there, the woman's face was transformed to that of the man on the road. Dave John screamed, and in fear, swerved off the road and hit a tree trunk. The woman had vanished immediately after she revealed her true self. Dave John could not say how he managed to get home. But once he recovered, he quit his job in the city and returned to the village. From his story, we figured that's how we found out that his bad leg was because of the injury he sustained on that fateful night. Now, after finding out about that's the end of the story, you know, uh, Dave John told us. <laughs> After finding out about Cooley Jumbi, it became clear to me that Dave John had constructed a grand narrative scheme for his young graduating audience. His faithful encounter embodied all the horror stories he had streamed into our consciousness up to that moment. That is, before I found out that the dead and living woman or man, uh, that a dead and woman, you know, was the same person as Cooley Jumbi 
hanging around the cemeteries and the consciousness of the Guyanese, uh, you know, uh, Guyanese since the era of slavery when those Africans made the Middle Passage. Dave John wanted, and this is the key here, that Dave John wanted us to make sure, wanted to make sure that by the time we graduated, he was no longer just the teller of ghost stories. The time we graduated, he wanted us to in fact see him as the text of a ghost story. For his final performance uh, to the graduates, he probably felt that the ultimate tale had to be him, not him telling stories about fictive characters and their vicissitudes. He had to be the text. And that idea, therefore, of understanding orality, of understanding the oral text, not as, you know, a text we hear through the voice of a narrator, but the oral text as, in fact, represented by the narrator itself, himself or herself. In other words, to, to put it another way, to see the narrator as the embodiment of the text. The, the difficulty, or in fact the impossibility of understanding the oral text as a text outside of its ambience, outside of the very voice, outside of the context of the audience, everything that is connected with that performance. That became, you know, the kind of aesthetic, you know, which is part of, you know, the African oral aesthetic. And in fact, uh, any, any other culture where the oral performance is, is promoted, you will also find that same dynamic. And so to me, therefore, understanding the text uh, in its complexity, in that, sense, in that way in which it embodies you know, both the human conveyor of the text and the story itself became the kind of aesthetic that I wanted to use to understand um, some of the writers, you know, whose work ultimately would become the, the source or the primary source for this text. Now, in, in doing that, however, I was very much aware, you know, it was, it was too profound to be ignored. This idea that here is this this security guard in an elementary school in a very rural area of eastern Nigeria, in West Africa. Uh, clearly, I'm not even sure if he remembers or if he's aware of the middle passage of slavery, you know, of everything connected with that story, or with that, with that particular moment in, in, in global history. But there he was telling this story, um, which Many, many years later on, I will encounter in a book, uh, you know, I will encounter in a book by a scholar, you know, detailing um, all the kinds of mythic narratives, you know, emerging from Guyana. Uh, what was this? Is, it a, is this some kind of ancient memory uh, that therefore, you know, that can transport the story I heard in that rural area? to the realities of writing as I encountered them in many years later. Uh, and so to me, therefore, it, you know, it was a very profound moment in the sense that suddenly the whole idea of black diaspora was no longer just you know, uh, some kind of theoretical grounding, some kind of political notion, some, some kind of, uh, of way of, of understanding people, of crap, carving out you know, uh, a territory of identity. It became something, you know, or the kind of thing which uh, at the early part of the book I, I referred to uh, somewhere like Paul Gilroy in his uh, Black Atlantic, where he gives us a kind of postmodern interpretation of what it means, to, you know, for the diaspora. Uh, and he places it within this sense of the image of a ship. You know, a ship that is bopping on the ocean without a destination, never arriving at any shore. And, and to him, of course, that postmodernist sensibility is in, in this dread of grounding. Uh, the idea of avoiding any kind of location stability or any kind of essence, but finding it in, in a kind of fractal, rhizomorphic, you know, form. And to me, therefore, it, it seemed that in as much as that kind of thinking opens up, uh, or that kind of argument opens up the notion of diaspora, it doesn't quite account for the kind of particularity that I saw, the kind of particular linkage I saw between D. John's story, in which he is a star, and this narrative, Kuli Jumbi, uh, which comes out from, from, from Guyana. 
and that is why therefore uh, it became very uh, I became very much interested in trying to understand both this idea of Dejan embodying that story and the different ways in which identity is constructed and the different ways in which certain black writers in the new world have tried to you know to engage that oral tradition what is this african um identity or this african folkloric or, or oral tradition that we find you know reverberating in different forms in the new world of course if you if you go back to the african aspect of it um, and this is something which I tried to locate in my reading of one of the authors uh, Roy Heath uh, the very first or is this second chapter of the text um, what you find in the African dynamic of orality is a sense in which like I've explained um, the text does not stand on its own the text is found in the reality of the performer the text is found in the reality of the audience. The text is found in the reality of the reception of that particular performance at that given time. And the text remains, you know, uh, implicated by the, that, you know, the gamut of those experiences, of, of those factors. Now, how does that therefore work out in the context of the new world where uh, even though we can still see societies or cultures or places where the oral tradition you know, is still celebrated, uh, the new world is defined by literacy. The new world is you know, defined by the written tradition. Yeah. How do we therefore begin to navigate you know, the, the, unique, the uniqueness of the oral form, of the oral tradition with uh, what is clearly the uniqueness of the written form? The oral word, you know, the one I'm just altering right now, it vanishes. You can't hold it. Whatever comes out from my mouth goes out, and you pick it up by your ears, and then that's it. You can't hold it. Um, and yet the written word is this thing that is there, you know. I, I think about what Pilate tells, you know, the people when they wanted him to change his inscription on the, on the, on the, on the cross. And they don't want him to say king of the Jews. He says, what I have written, I have written. In other words, he's done. Uh, he's not going to change it. It's that idea of the permanence of the written word. The idea that you can cite it, the idea you can move it, you know, it becomes portable. Words become portable. So how do you transform that? Um, how do you try to bring that connection? To me, therefore, it needed a re-understanding or a redefinition of what we mean by orality. It needed a redefinition or a reconceptualization of what we call folklore, which is, has always been the realm of the oral societies, you know, to believe that folklore are, you know, practices or performances that are located within certain societies where literacy has not taken root. And so to me, those were problematic, you know, or that kind of configuration of the idea of orality or folklore, you know, needed to be expanded. And that is part of what I do, therefore, to show that folklore in the first place is not something that is located within, you know, within certain societies that are oral-based. But in fact, that we do define folklore in ways in which it is meaningful for us. You know, when we talk about, I am the master of my domain, for example, that phrase, when we hear Seinfeld say that, uh, when we make that expression, uh, you know, that's just what, you know, to just take Seinfeld as, as a cultural phenomenon. Uh, if we begin to expand on, say, you know, the, the, the ramifications or the famous lines that we've received from that particular TV series, the way it has worked itself or the way these phrases or some of these expressions have worked themselves into the very cultural lingo of our society, uh, we are looking at actually something that comes very much close to uh, a modern day understanding or a more pragmatic understanding of folklore. Because these are still usages that operate in the local or in the oral form, but they have been rooted in a highly, you know, technologized, highly, you know, uh, electronic society. And yet their, their, their significance, their importance, you know, very much lies within 
the context of their performance in the everyday world. And so expanding the notion of folklore, enabling us, therefore, enables us, therefore, to begin to see ways in which some of the writers that I talk about you know, have also engaged it. Um, I mentioned the four writers that I, I, I discussed in a book, in, you know, in the in the novels by Roy Heath, the, Guy the Guyanese. Roy Heath passed away uh, last year at the ripe old age of 91. Um, and uh, in, in his novels, you encounter these characters, you know, that seem so restless, or that seem, you know, almost, you know, in always afraid of something happening, always, you know, never succeeding for the most part, uh, but always engaging in all kinds of irrational, uh, very unexplainable actions and decisions, and you look at them. And they fit within, you know, some of the, the bounds of, of the realism of the novel. But then you, you go back to understand some of the mythic figures, you know, that operate in Guyanese folklore. Or if you understand what he talks about, that there is this class of stories in Guyana uh, called anxiety lore. Lore means L-O-R-E. Anxiety law. These are stories that you know that define people who you know stories that were always about fear. You know, people who were wrestling with all kinds of terrible situations. Um, and and he says that this anxiety law was you know it was very prevalent, or that it is prevalent in Guyana because for the Africans who were moved from from Africa to the New World, there was something so both, you know, uh, existentially, you know, metaphysically and physically, you know, threatening about this new space. Um, months of being, you know, in ships, uh, you know, under very horrible circumstances. And then finally, if you survive the Middle Passage, you arrive onto this island where you are surrounded by water. And, the, and you are looking at this island, is, there are luscious beaches, all right, which you will never see because you will be pushed, you will be moved straight into the inlands, you know, where the farms were. Uh, and there you are facing mountains and jungles. If you go to a place like Trinidad and Tobago, a place like Tobago where there are jungles and, and you are going down, you know, below sea level, you know, and still people are staying there. Um, that if you, have, if, you, if you then come into that kind of space, there is a sense of foreboding. There is a kind of terror, therefore, that defines you know, your existence. And it's that kind of terror, therefore, that very much inspires certain stories, uh, the stories of fear. But these are stories that are frightening themselves, but they are frightening if only as a kind of mechanism to enable you to survive the very physical terror that you inhabit. And so he says that, you know, you cannot understand, you know, that best way, therefore, to understand the restlessness or the chaos that seems to define perhaps a little bit of the characters or events, his narratives, is to understand this anxiety law. Uh, and to me, therefore, it was very interesting to, to pick up on that particular idea because uh, what that does is to give us a clue or give us an avenue toward understanding, you know, of, of appreciating the folkloric tradition itself, which is very much prevalent in the oral form there, to understand it within the context of these, of the, of the mechanics of writing a novel, you know, the challenges of remaining real uh, in the way which we've come to understand the novel, uh, while also engaging the world of folklore where everything is possible. But then, the, but it couldn't be simply a matter of trying to understand uh, these oral forms, you know, reappearing in the forms in which we find them in his novel. Um, I was reading Toni Morrison, and, you know, or reading Toni Morrison, you find this very interesting dynamic going on, uh, where the oral form, you know, is celebrated. There are, you know, there are all forms, you know, folkloric forms that are operating in many of her novels. Uh, you take, for example, Song of Solomon, um, a very lengthy work. 
Uh, but you know, you know, the 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 story of the deaths, you know, the the family is a history. There's a story behind, you know, how they end up answering the dead family. Uh, but uh, the story of the deaths, you know, you don't understand, you know, may be very crucial there. You know, the definition how milkman finds, you know, his identity, how milkman finds his manhood and the like, may be there. But the heart of the story is actually an effort to decode a story or rather a song. That has been, go, been that has been passed on from generation to generation in little tiny pieces. Uh, it becomes almost the, you know the quest of milkman is no longer just about finding a pot of gold, a bag of gold, or, or some wealth. It's no longer as useful or as significant as milkman finding the full length of the text of this song that has been going on since their ancestor Solomon chooses to fly uh, back to Africa. The story is not interested in asking us, it's not interested in, in, in trying to define or explain scientifically if you can really fly uh, from, you know, from, from Detroit or from the South or anywhere in the United States, if you can fly you know, with wings or however back to Africa. That is not the critical thing. Uh, it's not the business of the text as much as you know, if milkman and other members of his family can come to the point where they begin to appreciate the dynamic that can make that possible in the first place. And so if orality in that, in that kind of point becomes very crucial in finding the identity of this particular family, you know, that have been written off for dead, as it were, in a, in a liter almost literally, you know, if it becomes very crucial for this African American family to locate themselves within the mythic, you know, dimensions of, of Solomon flying away, does it mean that orality or that the black text, you know, as far as the oral form is concerned, is always on the side of liberating the people? of liberating the, the black person in the Americas? Is, is the oral form always this virtuous form? Because it comes from Africa, uh, which therefore defines one of the great attributes of being of an African-American text. What I try to suggest is that, uh-uh, that in fact, it doesn't happen that way. Because in fact, Solomon, you know, rather that uh, Morrison also expands the whole notion of orality to show that sometimes uh, the oral form can also be used as a suppressive form. If you think about, you know, American history, racial history, where for the longest time African Americans were we are not educated, we are barred from attending schools, we are not even allowed to learn how to read and write. And therefore how, you know, so much of the black institution therefore was for the most part located within the oral world, you know, of, of, of these communities, be it through the dynamics of the black preacher in church or through the dynamics of all other kinds of cultural expressions. You may therefore say that if you are trying to understand African American agency that you or cultural agency that you have to go through the black text or you have to go through the oral world or the folkloric tradition, uh, which is something that somebody like Zora Neale Hurston therefore, you know, give her whole heart and, and, and energies into exploring and investigating. But then you go back and you know you then return to a book, a novel again by Morrison like Paradise. And suddenly the spoken word, the the, the folkloric form, you know, becomes you know something that creates a different kind of dimension, this time very much problematic. Because the people uh, in this community that we, we encounter are not, you know, their elders, the patriarchs are not very much interested in any kind of expansion of the understanding of their worldview in a way that at least accounts for the changing demographic, that accounts for the fact that their younger ones are looking at their world in a more pragmatic way. And they keep on insisting on a certain kind of patriarchal narrative which is not written down anywhere, but which is memorized, which is performed on Christmas days or on Christmas season and other kinds of events or other kinds of moments. And orality or the oral form or memory, that is, you know, the kinds of texts that are not written down, becomes oppressive. And to me, therefore, 
what that seemed to reveal was this idea, therefore, that it wasn't necessarily about there is no connection between orality or folklore in the African world or in the African New World uh, and virtue or liberation itself. That it is simply a strategy, you know, a, an expressive strategy, a kind of aesthetic which can be deployed either for liberatory purposes or for counter-liberatory or oppressive purposes. Uh, and that was very interesting to me, you know, to understand this new dynamic of orality because uh, I had moved, you know, and this is part of what we do, I, I do in reading Morrison, because I have moved from um, understanding the text you know, as a direct, that there is a direct correlation between orality, Africanness, and African American or African Caribbean identity. You know, to look at it now, not only no more as that kind of connection, but simply as a rhetorical strategy that could be deployed in any kind of dynamic. So it's that kind of, you know, dynamic, therefore, that plays out uh, in my reading. Uh, and it's just a way in which I'm trying to understand, therefore, these dimensions or representations of the oral text or what it means, you know, of what orality means in the black text, be it in the African text or in the New World text. That, that very much becomes the core of what I do in this particular uh, uh work here. I'd like to really pause here, you know, uh, and then I think it's only meaningful if we can have some kind of conversation. So uh, I'd rather pause here and uh, let us uh, have some questions. Is that is that fine? Sure. Okay. Yes. No, that, that's a good question, uh, and that's a good observation because indeed, uh, Hosting was so was so wonderful uh, in, in terms of understanding the the dynamics of oral composition, um, and so. And that is why, like you rightly note, uh, she wasn't simply interested in, in recounting or reporting uh, these stories or, or these sensibilities, these oral sensibilities, you know, the, the entire culture of the porch, as it were. Uh, she wasn't simply interested in noting that, but she was actually interested in, in, in recount, you know, in describing, you know, the ambience, you know, people's faces, people's expressions, you know, the connections between what is said at a given time and then what had transpired before. Uh, and to me, you know, um, and those were all well and good because what they reveal or what they show uh, was at least Hurston's keen understanding that the oral text in itself, you know, wasn't just a matter of reporting whatever was said, that you could not separate that context uh, from, you know, from whatever you hear or whatever is being uttered. And if you also think about, in fact, you know, of course, she took it to, to the height of it, you know, during her um, research into Haitian voodoo, you know, when she very much, in fact, went through the entire process of becoming a priestess, you know, of that particular religion, uh, which was also a way of making sure that she was totally embedded, you know, within that principle so that she could understand it fully. The, the, the thing, however, is that, you know, Hurston's work, um, look, you know, it's more, it, deals, it seems to me that what she does is, you know, is to give us a very expansive reproduction or I don't want to say reproduction because that would deny her own creative agency in the process. Uh, but to give us a very expansive or what you may call a robust um, you know, uh, appreciation of, of folklore you know, the, the, as a living art. You know, as something that is that is triggered by, or you know, through interlocutions, through interactions between people, as something that is, you know, you have to understand that it's not one person, you know, you know, generating this. My own concern, however, you know, you know, so I do 
pick up on that particular dynamic, you know, the full bore into of re of reproducing in a way uh, the folkloric, you know, uh, traditions, you know, that she that she taps into. Uh, my, my own concern, however, has been to see the ways in which um, a book, you know, if if you take for example Paradise by Morrison. Um, it doesn't announce itself in any way ordinarily as folkloric. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, and there are all other kinds of things going on there. But then if you think about the whole business of trying to, you know, between the old men and, you know, the old men and the young people trying to debate over the missing word. On that, on that particular, on that particular item, you know, and you begin on that particular stove, and you begin to see that that particular missing word becomes the very heart of the debate between the permanence of the written word versus, or in this case, the missing word, and the kind of hegemony that an oral text, uh, the way that the patriarchs, the twins, the Morgans, and the rest of them, the way that they have chosen to remember whatever they believe to be the narrative of their people. And to me, it is a more, you know, it, it is more complicated in the way that at least Morrison wants us to look at this idea of, of orality or this idea of the oral text. Um, if you also consider jazz, uh, the novel jazz, again, is, is that kind of engagement a, a narrator uh, in the in the old form in the in the African oral form or at least the way we usually try to see the, the form the narrator um, is the text as I suggested we listen to the narrator perform this story with all these dimensions we trust that person of course you know the dynamic of the oral text is also one that in the in the context of a performance if a member of the audience is not impressed by the way a story is going, he or she can say, uh -uh, you are not giving us the great lines from this story. Because this oral text is known by everyone. So it becomes all a function of how well can you tell the story. So somebody in the audience can say, you are not telling this story you know, in a very good way. I would like to take up this story. And from that moment, you know, whoever is telling the story has to change. A new narrator comes abroad. Um, so there is power invested in that particular, in whoever is telling the story at that given time. And so but then you come into jazz, the novel, and it has the appearance of the oral storyteller in the, in the form, you know, in the fact that the story begins with, you know, you know, a gesture, a sound that isn't a word as a way of, of, of the narrator sucking teeth or something. Uh, you know, it's, it's an oral gesture that we, that we find beginning the story. And we get the sense of a narrator who is really engaged in telling us, describing people, you know, appearing before her, you know, characters appearing before her, making her own judgments. But then at the end, or toward the end, we, we see this you know, extraordinary circumstance where the narrator says, you know, I misunderstood these characters. I didn't really know, you know, Joe without a trace. I didn't even know. I, I totally understood what I was saying. I had my own prejudices. I, I had my own fears or my own biases. And, and somehow, you know, it, it totally, you know, misrepresented what was going on. And that is why I'm totally shocked by, you know, the outcome of the story. You know, that, that's very interesting because, you know, it's almost like, a betrayal of the entire narrative, you know, protocol. We've always come to see that a narrator, you know, that we want to believe the narrator, especially if we're also understanding that the narrator working within the oral aesthetic, you know, is one that embodies the story, is one that carries the story, is the story. And suddenly we are looking at a dynamic where, you know, she's saying, uh, just like our president said, I screwed up. Um, I, I missed, you know, I missed this whole thing that was going on. And to me, you know, what that calls attention to is that uh, Morrison is also much aware of the way in which the oral form or the traditions of the of folklore, you know, of the way it is highly venerated 
especially in the African American world, you know, again, like I said, the whole business of literacy and the whole business of writing, the whole idea of of affirming self through an alternative means, you know, since literacy was for the longest time blocked off for them, you know, uh, for, for 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 that particular community. That to me, therefore, Morrison is very much aware of that kind of supremacy or that kind of privileging of that oral form, and to her. Um, the privilege of that form cannot come without some problems, part of which is what I call attention to in paradise. Uh, and, and so seeing the oral form as a strategy, as a rhetorical you know, form that is not necessarily tied to or that could be manipulated for you know, some other kinds of political or even narrative ends, uh, to me it seems to... Uh, open up a greater degree of use uh, than the very, the very defined application of folklore that we find uh, in, you know, in, a, you know, in Hurston. Uh, and that will include also uh, the eyes we are watching that. Yes. That's a good question, uh, which uh, somehow, thanks for also bringing Obama back into the mix. You know, I, I have been promised, and I didn't mention it in my opening statement. Um, Barack Obama, you know, offers you know such a very interesting dynamic, you know, in terms of understanding this, uh, this movement from Africa, you know, to the new world, you know, and the way, you know, we cannot. We cannot look at it with any sense of purity, uh, which was part of what, say, you know, somebody like um, <sighs> I've forgotten, you know, who is that man in the, you know, the Black Star Line, Marcos Garvey, uh, which was one of the things that you know, uh, Marcos Garvey, you know, was trying to advance this idea of the Back to African movement, the idea that Africa, you know, there is no other place where a black person can find, you know, satisfaction, can find liberty, can be at peace, you know, culturally, uh, existentially, uh, existentially outside of Africa, um, uh, uh, you know, and so. Beginning with the father, you know, Obama, you know, Obama Sr., you know, moving from Kenya to the United States. Uh, that journey, you know, and coming to the United States as a Muslim, you know, it opens, you know, it, it creates all kinds, it raises all kinds of questions. You know, one uh, is that, you know, by coming as a Muslim, of course, you know, it create, you know, we, we, you know, you remember the stories during the primaries and the elections, the whole, that religion, which must not be mentioned, uh, which, which defined, you know, Obama and Islam, at least, you know, for some, um, during the campaigns. What was not very, what was not always understood was this idea that Islam, you know, the fact that Obama's father was Muslim, uh, had already created its own ambiguities, you know, because it's not as though Islam is indigenous to Africa. Um, he, there he was, um, a, an East African, Western educated, <laughs> Uh, by virtue of the colonial encounter from the 18, late 1800s to the 19, you know, up to the uh, first half of at least of the 20th century, uh, being impacted by that particular colonial encounter, and before even that encounter, that he was also living within 
a society that had been conquered by, 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 by Islamic you know, jihadists back in the 17th century, or in fact, you know, earlier than that, you know, by, by Arab uh, uh, clerics, Muslim clerics coming from the north. Um, and, and so this is a man arriving to the United, United States carrying the burdens of, of, double, of, double, social, of double cultural you know, change you know, the, 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 the tradition of Islam um, and the traditions of, of his Western training and education. And he approaches and he shows up in the United States where, uh, for good measure, uh, he marries a white woman from Kansas. Um, and so uh, this is the kind of world in which, therefore, Obama emerges, you know, the president emerges. Understanding Obama, therefore, will have to require, uh, and to me, therefore, when he says that he's a mutt, uh, or when, you know, understanding Obama, therefore, will have to understand that uh, it is true that his father left him when he was about two years old and the like, but that this is somebody who is already, you know, operating, carrying the burdens of so many other kinds of cultural and historical associations. And, and so, whatever is his identity, uh, and we saw that, you know, that this idea that, you know, you couldn't place him or that we can't place him, you know, is he, is he Muslim because his father was a Muslim? Uh, is he pro-Western world because uh, his father, again, you know, was, you know, Western educated? Or does he have his sympathies for the white world because he's partially white by virtue of the mother? Uh, to me, therefore, that sense of hybridity, which is again a term which we find, you know, uh, is, is you know is, is you know that sense of hybridity, very much is the quintessential you know context in which we can begin to understand even the presence or, or the whole idea of blackness uh, in the new world. Um, you know the idea, uh, which is also why I, I bring it up in, in in relation to this test, because again you cannot understand the oral form. You can't understand the oral tradition, black oral tradition, outside without understanding that orality in the new world has also been impacted by the written world, by the written world, uh, by all other kinds of influences. You know, you can't talk about Morrison uh, without understanding you know, some other writers who have, you know, of whom she's, you know, of whom she's grateful for, who at least she identifies as an inspiration. You can't understand uh, the writings of, of Wilson Harris, for example, without understanding Greek mythology, which is also the same thing with Derek Walcott. You can't understand these writers without understanding Greek mythology and the like. Uh, and so, or, or, or even Roman mythology by extension, um, classical Roman mythology. And so, these are hybridities of form, of influences, uh, which also is what a part of what I try to do here uh, to make sure that we, I understand orality not in any kind of essential or basic form, but to understand it in a, in a rather pragmatic, dynamic way, in the very same way, say, that our president has deemed it you know, most meaningful to embrace this multiplicity of identities. And of course, um, we understand again at the early part of his, uh, of his candidacy uh, when the whole question of, you know, from the black community for good measure was if he was black enough. Uh, and then how that changed into maybe, uh, you know, and how ultimately he was taught you know, or at least it therefore was made to tar him with, you know, something that was considered the quintessential black scare in the, you know, in America, the black church, you know, represent, you know, the kind perhaps represented by Jeremiah Wright. So again, we are looking at a society therefore that seem to be engaging, you know, in that that want to that wants to return to some kind of essentialist understanding of that identity uh, in a new kind of dynamic where that is really not possible or where that is not even meaningful even if it were possible. Uh, and so uh, I see I see therefore his ascendancy in a, in a very good way. But there is even something more and I'll end the response there, uh, which is that uh, Obama's ascendancy is again to, you know, uh, as president, is also to, to 
bring up is actually a way of updating the, the nature and form of the African presence in America. Uh, for the longest time, we, we have, you know, we have always defined the blackness, you know, in the, in the, in the African-American form, i.e., you know, persons, you know, you know, whose ancestors were moved from the new world, from the old world to the new world. Uh, and, and the last 50 years or even more, there has been always, there has been this movement mass migrations of, immig of African immigrants coming into the United States. Um, these are now immigrants who are not being forced to come here. These are, these are the new Africans coming here by choice uh, versus the, the tragedy of, of, of the transatlantic slave trade. And we haven't been accounting in, in the discussion of the black culture or the black presence in the new world or in, in, the, in the Americas, we haven't been fully accounting for this group of Africans or at least in the you know at least in the discussion of black culture we haven't fully tried to see what these new Africans are bringing into these societies in, into a society and so the Obama place here for Obama's arrival very much, you know, calls attention to it. We now know, or at least, you know, his arrival reminds us that there were many like the Obamas in the senior, you know, who came over to the new world, who married, you know, you know, people in the new world and created the likes of Obama, you know. Uh, not all of them are Obama, of course, you know. Uh, but, but at least it opens up that discussion for us to see that new dynamic, which is also part of what I see going on in my reading of you know, Morrison, that in a way is that sense of trying to open up the understanding of, of orality, you know, beyond that ancient or classical sense of, you know, the final word coming straight from Africa, you know, into something that can be sometimes duplicitous. I'd like to, I'd like to end. Is that fine if I end, Stephen? Uh, my stock up here. Um, I'd like to end by calling attention to a chapter in the book. Um, and it's based on, it's a chapter on Gene Tuma, uh, where I read Cain. Um, some of you, you know, some of you may have encountered Cain, you know, in your readings or in your classes or, or somewhere else, or you may have seen some excerpts from that particular book. And uh, it's, it's usually highly excerpted in the sense that, or anthologized in the sense that, you know, I, I thought, you know, the people, anthologists always like to pick up sections of that book and place it there uh, because the way it is drafted or the way it is constructed, the book, you know, there are all these sections that seem a little bit disparate, you know, without connection. And what I do in the chapter on Cain, I've actually tried to offer a very different reading of that text. And what I do, and I'll encourage you, if you don't read any, any other part of the book, at least read that chapter. And it's, <coughs> none of the chapters are lengthy, so uh, that should inspire you. Um, uh, and what I do in Cain is to read the entire book as one performance, as one oral performance. Um, and so just like in the oral text, just like in the oral performance, a narrator sometimes enters into incantations, other times starts singing, other times start dancing, starts dancing, other times engages the audience in you know in singing together, and all kinds, you know, all of it coming within the same performance. Um, I, I, to me, the only way in which you can begin to understand the, the connection, the different sections of Cain, is to see those sections as the equivalence, not really equivalent, but in fact as the representations of those various rhetorical strategies that are available to the oral performer. 
Um, even in this, even in the stories, even you know, even even you know, because you look there, you find, uh, begin with beginning with Carintha, you know, you you find echoes of songs. Then you see the poems that are there somewhere in the middle. Then you see, you know, more stories and then some dramatic forms, you know, in cabinets. These are all rhetorical strategies I would like to suggest that do call attention to the multiplicity of forms that are evident in the performance. You know, in performance studies, we talk about th total theater. The idea of theater in its entirety, you know, comprising the visual, the oral, you know, you know, every part of it is all there, you know, it's all spectacle. And so if we pick up that aesthetic of total theater, then we can begin to understand the kinds of choices that Tuma makes, you know, in in Kane, and I think it's, you know, if I may say so, I think it's a more liberating, more enjoyable way of making sense of the entire text, especially if you come from the background where uh, you want a text to make one meaning, you know, to convey one total, you know, complete experience in itself. That may be a way to it. Thank you.